Tom do this, and Tom do that. I can't wait to get off work. That's Tom Waits here on Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Developing a green economy has been one of President Obama's central promises while on the campaign trail and since taking office. Well, my next guest believes that tightening environmental and consumer safety regulations and the American chemical and manufacturing industry is not only necessary for the health of the environment, but is good for the economy. Do you know what's in the mascara you wear or the toys your kids play with? Does the American chemical industry block regulation of products that may be linked to cancer, infertility, neurological and hormonal disorders? Do these lax environmental standards mean U.S. companies are losing out on one of the world's most affluent markets, Europe? Europe's stringent regulations require companies seeking access to their lucrative markets to eliminate these toxic substances and manufacture safer and greener electronics, automobiles, toys, and cosmetics. Award-winning investigative journalist Mark Shapiro is the author of Exposed, The Toxic Chemistry of Everyday Products and What's at Stake for American Power. Just out in paperback, he writes, quote, the European-led revolution in chemical regulation requires that thousands of chemicals finally be assessed for their potentially toxic effects on human beings and signals the end of the American industry's ability to withhold critical data from the public. Mark Shapiro is the editorial director of the Center for Investigative Reporting. Joining us here in the Firehouse Studio, welcome to Democracy Now! Thank you. Good to be here. Talk about makeup. Uh -huh. When a woman puts on mascara or lipstick or powder, I mean, someone's tested it, haven't they? Well, I'd like to think so, since I just had a little bit put on myself <laughs> backstage there. Um, uh, uh, unfortunately, this is uh, an illusion that a lot of Americans have, basically, that somebody out there in the government is uh, assessing the safety of the ingredients that they, and, and the cosmetics that they put on their body. And, uh, and I, think, I think this strikes really at this kind of—there's the, the, a deep mythology I think people have here in this country that the government is looking out for the health and safety when it comes to chemicals. And what I talk about in the book is really how that is unfortunately not the case and what the consequences are for our health, but also for uh, our economic and political status in the world. I want to get to the issue of the economy and the fact that you say that deregulation is actually bad for business. But let's talk about health for a minute. Talk about how the FDA got started and why cosmetics aren't being regulated by the FDA. Yes. Well, good question. So we're back in the 1930s, coming out of that whole, you know, they're in the Prussian era, this is the Roosevelt era, and the Food and Drug Administration was created at that time to uh, monitor the types of food and the types of drugs that Americans were taking. Well, at that time, there was a proposal to include uh, cosmetics under the purview of the Food and Drug Administration. That uh, uh, effort was derailed by the, uh, the cosmetics industry, which was a little more nascent than it is now, but succeeded in essentially exempting the cosmetics industry from regulation by the FDA. The only thing the FDA really looks at now is hair dyes. But uh, anything else, whether it's your, your nail polish, uh, uh, eyeshadow, um, uh, actually, shampoo, essentially personal care uh, products, is not regulated by the FDA. The FDA doesn't even have the power to regulate it. And numerous times in the Senate, over the last uh, 50 years, there have been efforts to actually expand the purview of the FDA, and it's been repeatedly beaten back by the cosmetics industry. Um, lipstick, lead in lipstick, is this yeah. an issue today? This, you know, it's, uh, I mean, it, it's actually fascinating. The, um, the, uh, there's an environmental group, uh, uh, Healthcare Without Harm, which demanded from the FDA its data uh, about uh, lead in uh, lipstick. And uh, the response that it got uh, repeatedly was, uh, you know, we're looking into it, we're looking into it, we're looking into it, and wouldn't, basically, in the end, wouldn't provide the data about lead in lipstick. So the answer as to whether it's still there is, uh, is, is yes, and uh, it, which is kind of extraordinary when you think of what lead does. I remember being a kid, you're not supposed to chew a lead pencil because it's like going to affect your brain. Right, and here people who wear lipstick are licking it all day. Yeah. Yeah. And then they're reapplying. Yeah. And then they're yeah. licking it again. Yes, yes, that is what people do with lipstick. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, 
and uh, they put, you know, uh, I mean, the skin, uh, one of the interesting things, medically speaking, is actually, it was fascinating for me to learn that the skin is actually an organ. The skin is an organ. It's a living, uh, it's a living organ. It's, it's, it's not just a covering of, of, of the human body. It's actually a living organ. So whatever you put on the skin ultimately makes its way into the, uh, into the body. And so, what, when you look at cosmetics, and there are an array of ways we get exposed to toxic chemicals, but when you, when you look at cosmetics, you have an array of substances that actually, uh, some of which mimic estrogen, for example, the, uh, the female sexual hormone, and uh, uh, which is, many scientists have a lot of concern about that idea. And uh, um, so what, what we've discovered, and the reason the reason I can, I know some of this information, and the reason I can even tell you about it, and obviously the reason I wrote about it in the book, or the, uh, the where I got that information, is uh, one, you have scientists who've been studying it in America, but two, you have this whole other body in the European Union, which has actually decided to ban a whole array of these substances, things that cause cancer, mutation of human genes, uh, reproductive damage. So the reason, I even know what kind of material is in cosmetics is not because the FDA has told us. It's actually because the European Union has taken the action to remove that stuff, and they have a list. What is the stuff? The stuff is an array of, uh, of, uh, of ingredients that cause, uh, that are determined to, to cause cancer, that are determined to cause reproductive damage, and that are determined to cause uh, mutation in human genes. They're called CMRs. So the, uh, the, the European Union actually looked at cosmetics. To t determine what kind of ingredients are being used, which of them cause uh, are potential contributors to. It's important to remember that when I say caused, the, 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 because people need to understand how like chemicals work. It's complicated. It's not like you put lipstick on, you're going to get sick. That is, is not how it works. But we're talking about an accumulation over life, o over the course of your life, over years and years, multiple times repeated, very, very minute amounts over the course of many years. And that's where the concern lies in many of these substances. Talk about um, a product you don't hear very much about in this country. You're not going to see on the ingredient um, list on, uh, on cosmetics or other things, and that is phthalates. Oh, boy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Phthalates. Uh, the more I found out about phthalates, the more I, I couldn't believe people uh, 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 we, we, we were contending with these things on a and regular basis. Phthalate starts with a P. Right. Phthalate starts with a P. It's a very unusual spelling, a lot of consonants. Uh, but phthalates are basically the, uh, a, a, a plastic additive that makes plastic soft. That's what I have on the, on the cover of the book, a little rubber ducky. Uh, the rubber duck uh, is traditionally made soft with phthalates. Kids play with these things, as they do with many other toys. And. Um, the uh, what's what's what, what what's interesting about that is that uh, studies have been done for years now, 10, 15 years, suggesting that the uh, phthalates, which soften plastic, contribute to the reduction of testosterone in young male infants, and are uh, very potent, you know, endocrine disruptors at an early stage in life, in particular. Uh, and these are used in a whole array of things, from children's toys. Kids suck on them. Kids play them. You know, they, they, they're, they're soft, so they play with them and squeeze them and throw them at their mothers and all that and their fathers. And um, they're also in our shower curtains, uh, dashboards and automobiles. Uh, you have phthalates. So uh, 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 what I uh, talk about here and what, what's interesting is about, starting about 10 years ago, the European Union began removing phthalates from children toys. Why? Because children suck on these things. And when they suck on these things, their uh, levels of phthalates are elevated, and, uh, and, they, um, and, and, and there could be a potential contribution to disrupting a very vulnerable endocrine system. Uh, the United, back and forth, back and forth, there's been massive lobbying by the American chemical industry to try to prevent uh, the Europeans from moving forward. Uh, they, fi they, they did move forward, and we finally, in America, 10 years later, uh, have actually banned, about six months ago, the U U.S. Congress finally banned uh, phthalates in the United States in certain children's toys, number one, 10 years after the European Union did, which means the European companies got a big advance on um, finding alternatives. Uh, and two, they're still selling out the inventory. So they're permitted to sell the inventory in America uh, until it runs out.
So you mean, for example, China makes these yeah. rubber toys? Not only China, U.S. companies, I presume, too. They well, can't you, go to the United States, but they they can't go to European to European countries, but they come to the United yes, States yes, because European yes. countries said no. Yes. So we yes. get the toxic. We toys. get the toxic toys. We get toxic electronics. We get the toxic material that other countries around the world are protected from. And that is what I found most, uh, you know, alarming in, in, in writing the book, was to find out that the United States has become the dumping ground. We used to be the country that dumped. banned a product and dumped it overseas somewhere, in the developing world somewhere. And now, uh, uh, now we, after, you know, a decade uh, of, of retreat from environmental uh, ideas, are the country that is the dumped upon country. And you can see time after time after time, uh, uh, with electronics, with toys, with the cosmetics. What do you mean electronics? Electronics, uh, there was a law passed uh, by the European Union saying let's remove uh, mercury, lead, chromium, cadmium, very potent neurological uh, toxins from electronics because they leak into the water supply when they decay and, uh, and, the, and the air and the soil. And so uh, 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 the, the, the large multinational companies largely adapted to the European laws, which is very interesting, because, one, we're talking about the Intels and Apples and et cetera, et cetera, of the world. That made the EPA completely irrelevant. EPA has basically dug itself into a hole of becoming com totally irrelevant to the decisions of major corporations, which are aligning themselves increasingly with, with, with the European standards. However, if you're a small operator in China or elsewhere in the spokes of the global economy, and you want to sell stuff to, uh, you only care about the American market, the American and the African and Latin America market, uh, uh, you can manufacture goods that you could never sell in Europe. And that's what's happening. You uh, attended a number of meetings in Silicon Valley. Explain what you watched unfold there, Mark yeah. Shapiro. Well, what we're talking about here is an enormous global shift in power. We are really talking about the, the notion that Americans think that we sort of set the tune, whether it's environment, whether it's en economic policy, financial policy, there's still an idea that we are the ones setting the tune that, and everybody follows. And the power shift that I write about here and that I think is fascinating is the emergence of the European Union as an enormous economic and political force in the world. So I watched in, in Silicon Valley, for example, uh, I, I sat in on these meetings where um, consultants came in from the European Union uh, to explain to American engineers the changes that were being required in Europe uh, if, to enable them to sell their products in Europe. These are major, these are the major name brand electronic firms. And I watched them explain, you know, starting in six months, is, uh, starting in six months, you've got to remove the lead, the mercury, the cadmium and chromium and synthetic uh, flame retardants from your electronic products. And you could see you could see the uh, world changing in front of their faces. These, these are guys who design these things. They, they made all these great things we have in our pockets, in our homes, and on your desk here. And suddenly, this new entity from far off in uh, Brussels, in this case, ahead of the EU, was, was dictating what was going to be inside them. It was a transformative moment, I think, and actually quite revealing of this kind of shifting global dynamic that we're in. So you now have lobbyists not only going to Washington, they're going to Brussels. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're on express flights to Brussels. K Street. To do what? To lobby. To lobby. K Street, basically, K Street, of course, the center of American lobbying in Washington. Uh, when the Europeans began trying to do these things, trying to change the, uh, the, 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 the production system or trying to protect people from some of the dangers of, of what's in these products, the uh, U.S. chemical industry manufacturers, they began flooding Brussels with lobbyists. And what's happened, and I've walked around the, uh, the, the European Parliament, the, uh, the European Commission, which is essentially the Congress and White House of the European Union, crudely put. Um, uh, uh, are now surrounded by the Burston Marstellers, the Hill and Knowlton uh, companies, all the uh, lobbying firms that we've become so familiar with in America moved wholesale to uh, to Brussels and have launched essentially a, 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 a transatlantic, uh, very aggressive lobbying campaign. It's been fascinating. If you need a portrait at all of the change dynamic in the world, you can watch, you can see that where the action has moved. Now, one of the reasons the action moved there is because over the last eight years, the only threat 
really coming to major corporate interest. The only major threat was coming from Brussels. Now we're in a somewhat different dynamic, of course, somewhat. I mean, we'll see what happens, still panning itself out. But those firms have not left. They are there. And if you go to the American, uh, the American Chamber of Commerce has a huge presence in, uh, in Brussels. And what they've tried to do is actually lobby. What's interesting is you can't lobby in the same way in Europe that you can here. I mean, you can't, you don't have campaign contributions, so you can't do those whole things. And uh, so the lobbying is a very different form. And I talked to actually some of the lobbyists, and they were kind of thrown off because you got uh, all, all different languages. The lobbying is very, is very different. The way you exert influence is very different. And to a great extent, uh, a, a good deal of the American lobbying didn't work and has been causing uh, backfires. We have to break, but we want to come back um, to Mark Shapiro. His book is called Exposed, The Toxic Chemistry of Everyday Products and What's at Stake for American Power. I want to ask you about uh, baby bottles. I want to ask you about bioengineered foods. Uh, that's coming up after break. with us. Watch over me. That's the Newport Jazz All-Stars from 1966. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, the War and Peace Report. And we're more than 40 years later. And the question is, who is watching over you? And do you need that when it comes to the products you consume or that you use? Our guest is Mark Shapiro. His book is called Exposed, uh, The Toxic Chemistry of Everyday Products and What's at Stake for American Power. Um, the issue of regulation is now being presented as, well, that's bad for business. And especially especially in these economically perilous times, uh, people have to let up. Your response to that, Mark Shapiro? I think that that is a, uh, a line that has been repeated so many times that it's almost tiresome to hear. However, people have begun believing it. There's something deep in the American uh, uh, psyche that says that, that, uh, that it's, it's we individuals in opposition to the government, and there's, there's a very, I think, profound American sense. That that, that that argument has plugged into over, over the last uh, two decades. And so what I actually wanted to do in, uh, in, in, in doing the book, really, was actually to see, all right, what happens when, when the government does get a little more intrusive into the marketplace? What happens when they start regulating? And what I found in Europe was that the, uh, when the government said, came in and said, wait a minute, you can't use these substances and these products. We want you to do things otherwise. You want to find less toxic alternatives. Over and over again, uh, uh, I found that the industries didn't shrink. They didn't. They didn't uh, lose market share. In fact, there were a lot of uh, new jobs created. Uh, 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 many new markets, particularly, for example, in, in international trade. If you look at the emerging economies, with the new middle class coming up in Brazil and South Africa and uh, Korea and other countries that are now in play, sort of between Europe and America, which direction are they going to go, are increasingly, uh, the trade figures are showing, uh, moving in a European direction when it comes to many of these products. And uh, so the, the interesting thing was actually to see the economic effects, because what happened in every one of the industries that I, that I looked at here, and it's even a broader uh, portrait, uh, there have been uh, there have been not the economic collapse that we keep hearing about, but in fact the opposite. And so I really wanted to look at this at this dynamic and say what happens when when when, when regulation happens. I think I think we've been operating with this ruse. And what I really enjoyed doing in the in the reporting was actually to see what happens. What's unusual now is that you have an economy that's comparable to America's. We've never had that before. That's a, that's a new phenomenon that is really just, I would say, about—that's uh, really just three years old or four years old, 
since 2005 when the EU became a consolidated, you know, really, truly integrated economy. So for the first time in history, we can actually see how these policies we've been discussing here in America actually work. Well, uh, staying on Europe, I want to play a clip of Stavros Dimas. He is uh, uh, on the European Commission for the Environment. He explained how tightening environmental and consumer safety regulations benefits the economy. The uh, uh, medical expenses for uh, chemicals-related diseases will be uh, less. Uh, medicines will not be needed. We shall not um, uh, lose uh, working hours and uh, the productivity will be better. So the overall uh, benefits of freights will by far uh, outweigh the cost to the industry. And this is Alain Perroy, the director general of the European Chemical Industry Council. He says in the long term, consumer safety regulations ultimately help the chemical industry. It's true that the uh, image of the chemical industry is not ranking first in public opinions uh, because there are fears about chemicals, about the, the hazards. So if we can demonstrate through reach that uh, well-documented dossier about uh, hazard exposure and risk and uh, proper risk management uh, is in place or is improved, we can indeed uh, enhance the confidence in chemicals. Now, he speaks for the chemical industry. Yeah. Mark Shapiro, author of Exposed. Yes, he does speak for the chemical it's industry. That it's interesting that he has an accent, yes. because I don't know yeah. if you would find American lobbyists for the chemical industry speaking like that. No, you wouldn't. And actually, what was uh, really something is I, I talked to not him personally, but somebody else in their organization in, in Europe as well as the American Chemical uh, Council. And what happened during the debates, there actually began to see a debate, uh, I mean, a, sorry, a division between the European and American chemical industry. They started United, and they, they started actually launching, they, they launched a joint lobbying campaign, essentially, to stop what Europe was doing. And after about uh, a year or two, they began to separate. You could actually see it, see it happening as the— um, uh, European chemical industry, which is by no means some uh, uh, far-seeing, pioneering, you know, uh, 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 environmentalist uh, enterprise, but they began seeing the possibility that uh, that these that these kind of policies could work, and the American chemical industry has just been repeatedly uh, stuck in the status quo over and over again. There's a very big difference even between those two industries. Many of which, you know, many of those European companies are here in America. You know, it's interesting. Do you think, as we talk about health care costs, that there's more concern in Europe because the states are paying the health care costs? Yeah. You know, single payer, yeah. they're yeah. paying for those costs. Yeah. Here, yeah. the state isn't so less concerned. Well, when uh, the debates began in Europe, one of the—you've identified the exact huge uh, 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 motivating force in um, Europe, the European uh, states pay for health care of their citizens. So when people, uh, advocates and scientists and as such, started arguing these cases with their governments, they made an economic argument. They said, look, you invest now in getting these things out of circulation, and in 10, 20, 30 years down the line, there are going to be billions of dollars in savings. And that's, in fact, what the European Commission now estimates. That by the, uh, the, these array of different environmental initiatives, they're, they're going to save up to 40, 50 billion euros over the next 30 years. So it's an enormous financial investment in the health of their, you know, citizens. And uh, uh, whereas in America, you know, it, God forbid something happens to any of us, basically, we're basically on our own. And so, uh, one, we're on our own um, financially, which is very— uh, difficult, and politically speaking, it creates a, a less receptive uh, political atmosphere because there's not the economic, you know, incentive. Are there companies that are ahead of the curve here? Uh, yeah. Yeah, there are companies that are ahead of the curve here. I mean, you know, there's a big changes in the market now, and I'm not going to use one name or another uh, uh, because I don't want them to offer me some sort of gig afterwards. Um, but uh, yes, of course, there are companies in America. Obviously, we have a changing atmosphere here in America in terms of uh, consumers being becoming more aware of these issues. But I would say one uh, key uh, element of that is yes, the market moves forward. Huge market, organic, this and that is is growing uh, dramatically. Natural products, uh, less toxic ingredients, more green, et cetera, et cetera. But there is a very key difference between the market moving those forces and laws. 
And if you don't have a law, what you have is a market that if people have the money and the knowledge, they can actually go seek out the products, and I'm sure people can figure out how to do that. But if you have a law, people, it, 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 it makes it far more equitable, because everybody gets the same protections, whether you have the resources or the knowledge, to, uh, to pursue the alternative. So I think there's a big difference. I said I'd ask you about baby bottles. Oh, boy. <laughs> Uh, well, you know, it's. Um, I, haven't, have I haven't used one in a while. In them? Uh, I don't believe they have phthalates. phthalates. Uh, I don't believe they have phthalates uh, any longer. But uh, I believe they do have. Some of them have BPA, which is bisphenol A, which is a uh, a, a big issue right now as to uh, how safe uh, bisphenol A. A lot of fears that it that it is a potent uh, endocrine disruptor, possible carcinogen, and. Uh, a, and huge why are they in bottles? And can you ever well, find out how you can get them without that? Uh, well, you can actually go to a uh, store, and if it says no bisphenol A, then you could probably trust it. But the point is that there is no requirement that that be disclosed to you. And that's what we do not have here in America. We don't have a requirement that, 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 that companies tell you what's inside their goods. So I think there actually has to be kind of a change in that regard. I mean, there, the, the reason we don't know a lot of what's in the goods is not some sort of accident. It's not because it's some incredibly complicated uh, uh, formula to figure out. It's because steadily over time, there have been efforts to keep that information from the public. And, uh, and I think a lot of what's, what, what's interesting now is that there are levels of disclosure required on European products that are not required in American products. We live in a global economy. So the, that information is going to start making its way back here to the United States. And I think it's going to start creating some interesting tensions when people start seeing information disclosed there that's not disclosed here. What about deodorant? Deodorant? I don't know about deodorant. I, I, I think uh, I don't know. I don't know the answer to deodorant because um, uh, it's got. Here, here's 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 the only thing I can tell you is that synthetic aromas are something I would not want to immerse myself into too deeply because the uh, particular nature of those concoctions uh, is have been called into question. So now, um, the power of the chemical industry here, um, the power of the European Union uniting, uh, what that means, the history of that, of the mm -hmm. European Union, and what you can expect to see, perhaps Africa, too. Um, mm -hmm. Now, Gaddafi, um, right, uh, head, saying that, the, that all of African countries should come together and form that kind of bloc like Europe. Yeah, I mean, what's, what's fascinating, of course, when we talk about European Union, I think it's, it's a fascinating political experiment. It's, and and, it's, and it's, it's been, because what you have is 27 different countries, and uh, from all the way in Spain, of course, to Finland, to Sweden, to Cyprus, and uh, they've decided to voluntarily integrate their, uh, their economic, uh, enormous portion of their economic systems, and to develop a joint uh, political structures. And they've got a, a, essentially a parliament, uh, an executive arm, and they have a judicial arm that enforces the kind of accords between the different nations. So this, as a, as a political, uh, 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 they call it an unidentified political object, I mean, it's one of the uh, uh, ways that they describe it to themselves in, in, in Europe. Um, and, and this entity, uh, uh, aside from having a lot of nice wine and cathedrals in Europe, what's interesting is that in 2005, this entity, the European Union, became essentially the world's largest economy, so uh, supplanted the United States as the world's largest economy. So this notion of coordinated uh, uh, activities between countries in a world in which trade—this is one of the effects, the long-term effects of globalization. You were there, you know, 10 years ago, you saw the debates over globalization. And who thought this would have happened, that this assemblage of, uh, of countries would actually begin to have stronger uh, environmental uh, uh, protections and radiate those through the, throughout the global economy? I don't think people anticipated that 10 years ago. So now— What's interesting is that other parts of the world are beginning to assemble themselves. So look at Mercos look at you mentioned the African Union, which is actually beginning to see the European Union as a model for allying itself and beginning to assert its authority in the global economy. Similar things happening with Mercosur in our own backyard down in, in I mean in Latin America, where the Mercosur countries, I think it's now five or six Latin American countries, have banded together in an economic uh, alliance. 
that has certain common policies and which is detouring the United States, not detouring, but the, uh, their primary trading partner is no longer America. It actually is the European Union. Mm -hmm. So this notion of how America exerts its influence in the world through trade and through standards, which the world used to follow, is no longer the case. It's a much more complicated and fluid. Finally, Mark Shapiro, uh, lawmakers pushing for a new government agency that would be responsible for food safety in the wake of the massive salmonella outbreak as a result of the Peanut Corporation of America, a bill sponsored by Connecticut Congressmember Rose DeLauro, uh, uh, would divide the Food and Drug Administration in two, separating the agency's drug oversight and food safety duties. Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack has gone further, suggesting all the government agencies are responsible for food safety, including those that are part of the Agriculture Department, should combine into one. Do you see this as a positive development? Well, well, well first of all, I think pay, uh, 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 <laughs> paying more attention to food safety is a pretty important thing. The, FDA, the, the USDA has just not been there on this. And actually, there's a lot of corollaries between the, the way we treat food and the additives we put in food and the chemicals we put in food to the kind of chemicals that I write about in, in, in terms of products and such like that, in terms of lack of regulation, pullback of uh, restraints, grandfathering onto the market, whole types of food treatments and such like that that never got the oversight like. that was needed. Like, uh, for example, the use of uh, hormones in, uh, in, in, in beef. The, uh, you know, this is an enormous dispute right now, but much of the rural does not allow hormones to be uh, used in, uh, in human beef. We have 10 beef. seconds. All right. And so I think, but I think this is a very interesting time ahead. Enormous possibilities uh, as, as Obama looks at some of these issues and responds. Well, I want to thank you for being with us, Mark Shapiro, uh, author of Exposed, the Toxic Chemistry of Everyday Products and What's at Stake for American Power. Uh, Clive Stafford-Smith will not be with us today. We hope in the coming days. Uh, talking about Binyam Mohammed just released in Britain from Guantanamo. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks for joining us.